Can I just say before we begin that we have a terrific lineup of speakers and panelists ready for you today. So please, in advance, join me. Let's give them all a huge round of applause. Thank you very much indeed. You know there's a wonderful quote from the great management guru, Tom Peters, and he said this. He said, you know, opportunities are a lot like buses. You can wait an awfully long time for one to come along, then a whole batch of them come along together. But here's the thing. You better make sure that you know the one that's right for you. So when you get on board, the journey takes you to the right place. And the reason I mention this quote today, ladies and gentlemen, is because we're all crucially aware that there's never been a time when there are more opportunities to be avowed in our industry than right here, right now. Because things like the advent of technology, the advent and growth of telematics, the slow but sure transition to new energy, all of these things are opening up a whole new diverse realm of opportunity. But of course, there are challenges too. How do we know? which opportunities are going to lead to profitability? How do we train our teams and our stakeholders to properly understand the new technologies? How do we use technology which is affordable in both the short and medium term and will indeed give us the revenue projections that our management teams are asking for? Well, today, this will be our quest. But before we start, I'd like to take you on a short journey. It's only gonna take four or five minutes, and it's a journey that I believe tells us something quite fundamental about the advent of technology and the opportunities that technology has for us today as we make the transition towards a world increasingly based around the concept of new energy. I want you to come back with me to the year 1834. It's a very long time ago. The world was a very different place in 1834. Sure, there was mass production, courtesy of the steam engine. Sure, there was, long over, there was long range transport. There was an incredible rail network already developed by 1834. But again, that was dependent on the steam engine. The world of the internal combustion engine hadn't happened yet. And perhaps even more importantly, the world of electromagnetism had yet to be discovered. And that's why I'm taking you back to February the 12th, 1834. It's a freezing cold day, and we're going to the Royal Institution in the heart of London's West End. And the Royal Institution is run by a very colorful entrepreneur called Sir Humphrey Davy. And a couple of years before, he had recruited a very aspirational young man by the name of Michael Faraday. And Faraday had left school at 12 years old without a single qualification. He came from a tough working class background in the East End of London, and he was relentlessly bullied at school, and he dropped out at 12 years old without a single qualification. But just before he dropped out of school, he went with them on a school trip to see the Christmas lecture, the annual Christmas lecture at the Royal Institution, and he was spellbound by what he saw. So every year he's been back to see a Christmas lecture, he then got a job as an apprentice chemist. He left that and got the most humble entry possible into the Royal Institution. And Sir Humphrey Davy recognizes that this young man has a great work ethic, and he says to him, please, I'd like to entrust you with this year, 1834, this year's Christmas lecture. And neither he nor Michael Faraday realizes what is about to happen. On this particular day, February the 12th, Michael Faraday is trying to put together an experiment with magnetism. So in one hand, he has a permanent magnet, and in the other hand, he has a coil of loose wire. And purely by accident, he passes the magnet through the coil of wire. And he notices, he has a very basic galvanometer, and he sees that the needle flicks. He wonders why that would happen. Now, many other scientists have seen that same flick on a galvanometer before him. Nothing new in that. But they believed that it was because the curl of wire was blocking the field of the magnet. But he thought that maybe the magnet was doing something to the coil of wire. So he took a second galvanometer and attached it to the other end of the coil of wire, passed the magnet through again, 
And indeed, that same flick showed at the end of the coil of wire, not just in the field of the magnet. He then re replicated the experiment by doubling the wire, and the effect increased by 10 times. He then turned the wire, the wire into a spring coil, and the effect increased by 1,000 times. And he realized that this was something quite extraordinary. And this was indeed what he then demonstrated at the Christmas lecture in 1834. But then, so what? Isn't this just a kind of game? It doesn't actually do anything. But of course, what he had done was to discover electromagnetism. And he was the first person in history to realize that actually it was putting an electric current through the wire. And here's what he then did. And this was what was going to create the dynamo, the generator, and the electric motor. And this next step is what enables us to be in a room today with AC, electric lighting, and to talk about the transition to new energy. What he then did was set up a basic experiment where he reversed the effect. And he had a second coil which was running an opposite polarity. And when he put the two together, the second coil started to move in a certain direction and he had invented the electric motor. Now, what then happened was that in later life, he went on to develop this, and of course, the experiments which he patented were then picked up by the great electrical geniuses, people like Nicholas Tesla and Thomas Edison. But also in later life, he befriended a young Scottish mathematician who was to become the greatest mathematician of the 19th century, James Clark Maxwell, and together they showed that, in fact, electricity, magnetism are actually one and the same phenomenon, and that there's another component as well, light. They are actually all the same phenomenon, and their work, but this is another story, their work was then recognized 30 years later by a young Austrian mathematician who was going to become the greatest physicist the world had ever seen. Albert Einstein, and he realized that there was a fourth component that belonged to the same family, gravity. But that's another story. Now, I'm not saying today, ladies and gentlemen, that we're going to leave here with the experimental genius of Michael Faraday. How I wish we could. But what I am saying is that we're going to leave here today with a much better understanding how to leverage the tech, which is so central to our, our industry here and now in 2023. And to start us on that journey, there's nobody better placed than the head of content of Truck and Fleet magazine, Middle East, Mr. Stephen White. Stephen, great to see you here. Good morning, everyone. It's an honor to stand in front of you all today. Uh, I won't speak for long because obviously we've got, qu I mean, I think this is actually one of our best programs yet. I'm delighted that uh, the speakers have agreed to join us today because I think they're a really stellar lineup of speakers. So thank you so much for doing that. And thank you all of you for freeing up your time. Um, the, when we put the event together, we came up with the concept of making fleets be smarter and greener. But I think that there's some other th themes, I think, that lead off that, which is, I think, they're just as important, which is the need for innovation, optimization, and as an industry to take a lead uh, within our own industry, but actually beyond that as well in, in the wider economy. So um, hopefully this is a one element of what is an ongoing process, but, uh, but hopefully in some way today we can sort of see some improvement, some development. Because uh, I think that this particular theme really sums up the challenges and the opportunities that the truck and fleet industry, the transportation logistics sectors, whatever way you want to call it, is, is facing. Um, the industry is evolving. Uh, we only have to look at some of the technological advances that we're seeing. They're being embraced here. They possibly weren't maybe five years ago, but we're actually starting to see some real traction um, in some very interesting areas. Um, I'm sure we'll probably discuss some of those in our panels and our presentations today, so I won't dwell too much on those. But I think the important thing that I want to state really is that as leaders of an industry, you all and your partners and your customers and your customers' customers um, really do need to 
acknowledge this, this, the changes that we're undergoing here. You know, we're going to talk about electric vehicles, autonomous vehicles, artificial intelligence. Uh, those are really exciting developments, but you know, I always think about the critical stuff like operational costs, fuel costs that continue to go up and down. So uh, these are really important challenges, I think, that people on the fleet side are facing every day. And I really hope that if you have the opportunity to ask a question or you're taking part in the discussion on the stage today, that you come up with some suggestions that can help fleets to tackle those challenges. Because um, I really think this industry can be a positive force for good. I do think that it has sometimes a underestimated value in terms of the economy and what we're trying to do here socially as a society and um, a lot of the development and growth that's happening. Uh, not just in the UAE, Saudi Arabia is, is, I'm sure many of you here are spending a lot of time in that particular market absolutely crazy at the moment. So lots of things happening. We'll talk about many of those today. Um, but uh, yes, I mean, I think probably I'd like to thank all of you for your dedication to this particular, facing up to these particular challenges. Um, and I'm sure there's lots that we can do and I'm sure we'll come across a lot of the solutions today. So I'm not going to speak for long. Uh, I do want to thank our sponsors, uh, our gold sponsors, Bridgestone and UD Trucks. Um, UD Trucks uh, have had, if you want an indication of, of just exactly the sorts of stresses and strains we're under at the moment, UD Trucks are currently suffering what must be their third bout of COVID. So, uh, and um, they were unable to attend today, which is, it just shows you just, if, if, if you were under any um, illusions that we're not quite out of the, I was going to say out of the fog, because I'm in the fog here. So uh, we're not quite out of the, um, out of the open yet. And also our silver sponsors, Total Energies Marketing Middle East, Transport Overseas Shipping, which we'll hear just very shortly from Richard Hall, um, as well as Domitech. And Domitech do have a demonstration of their technology just outside this exhibition, or outside this conference room in our exhibition area. So please do take a moment to look at that during our break. That's enough for me. I'll be on the stage later on anyway, but I just want to say thank you and um, let's, uh, let's start the conference. Thank you very much.